A man without arms cannot carry. He was not whole. Understand it was never about you. It was about the suffering and brokenness of him, a man, flawed like all the others, maybe more. People who have suffered in their lives are stunted in their adult experience. He may need his mommy and his daddy himself. If you are comfortable, allow him to rough your hair, to rest your head on his shoulder, to tightly hold your forearm as you cross the road. Let him coddle you. Let him fuss. He may try to insist on you being home at a reasonable hour, on you eating your vegetables, on working or settling down. You may feel resentment and independence rumble in your belly. Breathe into forgiveness and let him. And prepare for three-year-old syndrome, believing everything your daddy says for some time. Every year of your life will be meeting him. And most of those years will trust blindly. Remember he is human too. Remember your grain of salt when hungrily consuming his mind and his words. This story started off as a series of text messages I sent to one of my friends in Cote d'Ivoire who was meeting his father for the first time in his 20s. And this is my personal experience and advice that I had from him. And I realized it helped a lot of other people too, so I decided to make it into an article. So the first time I met my father was in Lagos. Um, I came to Nigeria in 2014 uh, in part to launch my business and secondly to connect with my father. What really brought me to Nigeria was this deep urge to use my access and my privilege to build up the next generation of African innovators. So on both sides of my family, my mom was 23 years in the military. She served in Iraq in various wars, dedicating her life to her country. My aunts were in the Peace Corps and other jobs like that. My dad's a pastor, his side of the family are in medicine, etc. And so on both sides, you have people who just dedicate their lives for the betterment of humanity. And it's something that was so deeply ingrained in me from a child, or from my childhood. Um, I knew that in Nigeria, and as I grew older, knowing in Nigeria, population of 200 million and 75% of them under the age of 35 with 25% youth unemployment. Knowing while I'm working in JP Morgan, while I'm, while I'm in private equity research, just you know, getting my checks, spending, buying, living my life in the US, knowing that I could either contribute to the positive change of those demographics. I could build careers. I could make a strong next generation of youth who are high skilled, employed globally, or I could just enjoy my life and ignore the realities of the continent. And who knows what could happen if I'm not involved, if those of us returnees, etc., don't get involved. So of course it was in part to reconnect and be close to, you know, I spent the first 20 years of my life with my mom's side in the US, the next 20 years will be with my father's side in Africa. And of course, that was so fundamental. But even deeper than that was this urge that kept me up at night. I was, you know, working in my comfortable life and finance, et cetera, in the US, and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't talk about anything else. And I was just so obsessed and so focused on tech on the continent and youth on the continent and the things that I could do with my privilege and my investment and my resources. And so coming back was really to take advantage of my privilege, of my access, and build up the next generation of African innovators. So I can talk about my first pitch competition, which was <laughs> rough to say the least. Uh, it seems like because, you know, now we have this fund, we have the nonprofit, we have, you know, our advisory company, like everything was smooth, smooth sailing, but I promise you, my first three years were 
I don't wanna say embarrassing, but I was definitely learning and it wasn't my brightest time. So I had just launched Ingressive. We just led, led our first trip and I was still trying to understand uh, product market fit and, and our business model. And uh, a very close friend and investor of mine, a very successful investor from San Francisco, invited me to South, South by Southwest. And there was, it was a private exclusive event with maybe 50, 75 of the top investors came and he got me a spot to go up on stage and pitch. And this was my first formal pitch for Ingressive Capital. I'm like, you know what? I'll do it. I can just wing everything. Don't worry, you know. And I get up on stage and I'm like, ingressive cap, ingressive, ugh. It was nonsense. The words just made no sense. And uh, needless to say, they, they like lovingly came and were just like, just give me the mic. Just, it's okay, it's okay. And so that one failed and I got off stage and he was like, you know, Maya, it's okay. We all have to fail our first couple of times. Just maybe go home and practice a few times before you do your next pitch competition. But it's so interesting because um, no matter if I win or, or fail, I collected the information of almost every investor who was at that event, every investor who was at the, that event, and I followed up with them. And every next achievement that I got, though I made no sense at that event, whatever, but every next achievement, every new group of investors we brought to the continent, every new deals that were done, every press mention of mine, every, every uh, article that I wrote, everything, I followed up with these people. And I can't tell you, but at least two, maybe three of that group of people became my investors in my fund after that because I followed up with them and they saw my growth over time. I, was, I started my company at 23. I had about a year of work experience. Um, left private equity research to launch this business. And this was before tech in Africa was cool. Now everyone's like, ah, Andela, Jumia, da da da. They have those household names. But before, when I was pitching Africa, it was like, ah. So do they have internet there? Like, what's going on on the continent? Nobody, you know, it was still the babies with flies on their face, perception across the US, nobody actually knew what was happening on the continent. It was a long process. It was a long process to convince and teach and share really just, no stories, just really what's happening on the continent. The incredible innovation, the drive, the dedication, you know, People don't know this, but Nigerians are the most educated nationality in the US, like wherever we go, wherever we go globally, there's a ceaseless work ethic and this strive for achievement. And that shows, as you see in the tech ecosystem and how things have just scaled rapidly even over the last five years. So when I started out, it wasn't easy and I had to spend, you know, months I don't want to say harassing, but I was very consistently following up with people for a prolonged period of time until they agreed because they didn't want to be bothered anymore. And that was, I went to Silicon Valley. I was convincing investors to come to the continent. And of course, nobody's first answer was yes. Uh, I had never brought investors to the continent. I had never led deals before. I'd never even run a business before. And over the course of about six months, I convinced 10 of the top venture capitalists from San Francisco to join me in a trip to Nigeria. And after that trip, every one of them made investments. And over time, we kept leading these tours. We started building out firms' business strategy on the continent. We started leading investments on the continent. And over time, these clients became investors in what we launched as Ingressive Capital, which we recently just closed uh, $10 million to back emerging entrepreneurs on the continent. My name is Maya Horgan Famodu. I'm the founder of Ingressive Capital, which is a $10 million early stage VC fund backing emerging entrepreneurs across Sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt. I also co-founded Ingressive for Good, which is a nonprofit that provides micro scholarships, technical skills development, and talent placement for African youth. This is my first. <laughs>